Good morning. A tax mess, a police fine and controversy over public jobs. It's a tricky morning for the Tories. Nothing's easy for the Prime Minister right now. Questions still chasing his cabinet colleague, Nadim Zahawi. Have anything you want to say? About whether he paid enough tax. Sorry, are you avoiding answering questions about your taxes? And new claims this morning that this man, the BBC chairman, helped fix a deal for Boris Johnson, who then gave him the job. There are demands in the Tory party that the government should give us some hard-earned cash back, yet the Prime Minister seems to suggest it would be daft to think about tax cuts yet. If you're not idiots, you know what's happened. But he made his own mistake, forgetting to buckle up in the back, breaking the law and being fined. Expectations for the economy might have improved a touch, but making ends meet is still the biggest challenge for families and firms. I can't give them the things that you would like to give them, like the new books. I can't afford to do it anymore. With a new promise from Labour to help keep a lid on bills. We have one big question this morning. Is Rishi Sunak keeping his promise to run a professional government for us all? To answer that, James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, joins us. The woman who'd be your Chancellor if Labour wins the next election, Rachel Reeves, is here. And the latest of our leaders' interviews for 2023. We'll hear from Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister. And with me at the desk to help make sense of what that lot have to say, the Chair of Tesco and Imperial College, John Allen, the LBC presenter and journalist, Rachel Johnson, and Sir Ian Duncan-Smith, Tory MP, who used to lead his party. Good morning and thank you for being with us. It has not been a great week for the government, with a feeling that Rishi Sunak can't quite catch a break. Let's have a look at what's making the news on the front pages this morning. You can see the broadsheets there, a photograph of the cabinet minister Nadim Zahawi on the front, who's in a bit of a pickle over his tax affairs. That story also on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph. And a paper on the bottom of the Sunday Times, an interesting story about the BBC chairman, Richard Sharp, the paper claiming that he was involved in setting up a finance deal for Boris Johnson during the process when he was applying for the job, which is appointed by the government. We'll talk a bit about that and much more, I'm sure, a bit later on. But let's show you the front page of the tabloids. And they go for the royals, but different stories. The Mirror there talking about Prince Harry's account of what happened while he was a pilot. The Sunday Express giving us news of how the coronation might be. The Sun talking about Prince Andrew in the mail, also there talking about Prince Andrew's potential ongoing legal travails. So lots of news around, but Sir Ian Duncan-Smith, I think Nadim Zahawi, he made a statement yesterday about his tax affairs, but do you think it'd be better if he just published everything that had happened and came completely clean? Well, I'm always of view of these things, so the sooner you can get the absolute facts out, the better, rather than have them coming out in phases. I, I just want to say I know Nadim very well. Uh, he is, in a way, a peculiar British success story because as a, a person that's come into the country fleeing from Iraq has been successful in setting up a global brand. So all of that, in a way, is remarkable. And it says a lot about the UK, diversity and everything else. But, uh, and I'm, I'm obviously very fond of him, but I would say to him, if I was here, get it all out now, whatever you have to do, and clear it up. I genuinely don't believe this is a man who's deceitful in any shape or form, but this goes on and on and the media waits. So I think I would just clear it up. Rachel Johnson, what do you think the public <coughs> thinks of this? I mean, it's a man who's done very well, as Ian Duncan Smith says, set up a successful business, but he says he's carelessly had a bit of a snafu with the tax man, and there are millions of pounds involved here. This isn't, you know, a bit of loose change. Yes, I mean, a if he's paid whatever it is, I know he says he doesn't recognise the figure, something in the region of £5 million. Pounds. That is quite a lot as a penalty for what I think the HMRC is calling carelessness, which, mm -hmm. as I understand it, is an actual term within the tax code, similar to negligence in the legal code, isn't it? So it actually means that you haven't taken enough care. Um, over maybe several years and to, to get your affairs in order. Now, as far as commentary on, on what Nadeem Zahawi did, I mean, I find my own tax 
affairs so complicated. I couldn't possibly comment on, on whether he has broken the law or not. But do you think the public care about <coughs> things like this? Yes. Mm. Because? Yes, I do. Because this is absolutely going to be trending and whenever any government minister goes out on the stump, they will be asked about this, especially when the tax rate is at a 70-year high. Well, it's just something lots of Conservative yeah. voters don't like very yeah. much. Um, just lastly to you, Richard, uh, John Allen, briefly, if you can. There's been a bit of, oh, the economy might not be as bad as we thought, news about this week. But is that what you're hearing from your millions of customers? <clears throat> not really. I think many people are coping well with the cost of living crisis because they've got enough income to do so. But I think there are many millions of people in this country who are really suffering, struggling to be able to afford food and thus the growth of food banks and so on. So uh, I, I mean, the, the hope is that inflation will start to abate perhaps later in the year. But, you know, going down from 11 percent to 10 and a half percent or whatever it is doesn't make a real difference to anyone. It's not exactly a big thumbs up. OK, all three of you, thank you very much for now. Plenty of hard work for you ahead, so don't go anywhere now. As we were just hearing from Rachel, there's no question that the tax affairs of the government, Minister Nadim Zahawi, are a headache for the government. But yesterday, after lots of queries over a long period of time about his taxes, he released a statement. Now, the implication was he had indeed paid a penalty to settle with the taxman after making arrangements about his tax involving his old firm, YouGov, and shares that he gave to his father. The implication was also that he sorted it out while he was Chancellor. We will try and find out exactly what's been going on in a second. But let's first ask the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, about a different story this morning. Great to have you with us. Um, we've been hearing today about some of your old friend and boss, Boris Johnson's dealings with the man his government appointed to be chair of the BBC, Richard Sharp. Now, the Sunday Times has reported that Mr Sharp fixed a meeting between a wealthy businessman who ended up providing essentially an overdraft of hundreds of thousands of pounds to the Prime Minister and a senior civil servant while he was applying for his job. And that wasn't declared. Foreign Secretary, should that have been declared? Well, I've only seen the uh, details that, uh, that you've seen in the, in the papers uh, overnight. I've not had the chance to discuss this with any of the people that have been involved. Uh, I have met Richard and I spoke with him um, with relation to the BBC World Service, which is of course an incredibly important uh, voice internationally and one of course where the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office has a direct interest. Uh, but I know that he is an incredibly uh, accomplished, incredibly uh, successful individual who brings a wealth of experience with him. That is why he was appointed to chairmanship uh, of the BBC. But I've not had the chance to discuss any of the issues that were brought up today. But uh, I have absolutely no doubt he was appointed on merit. And uh, the, the point that I would just uh, remind people of is it, it is not unusual, and indeed there is nothing wrong, for uh, someone to um, uh, be politically active prior to their appointment to senior BBC uh, positions. That's been, uh, that's something that's happened uh, pretty regularly in the past. But on principle, Foreign Secretary, should he have declared that connection in full? And what do you say to viewers hearing about this this morning who just think again, this looks like Boris Johnson doing favours for his friends? Are you worried it gives that impression? Well, look, I, I, I know there, there may be the perception of that going on, but Richard is an incredibly accomplished uh, individual. Had he not had a very, very successful uh, career, uh, with, you know, giving him a wealth of experience before putting himself forward for BBC chairman, he wouldn't have even been in the looking. So, so this is someone who uh, I know has brought a lot of experience uh, to the role. The conversation that I had with him about the BBC World Service uh, made it very, very and clear that he's been very, very thoughtful. And that's not the question here. The question here is about political links and whether or not, on principle, you as the Foreign Secretary, a very senior member of the government, think that it would always be better to make these things completely clean, completely out in the open. You said there that perception matters. Would it therefore have been better for this mm. all to be out and completely transparent? Well, look, uh, of course, uh, perception matters. Of, of course it does. 
Um, and you know, it is it is not, I'm sure, anything that Richard would want having this conversation this morning, being about what did or didn't happen uh, at some point in the past with regard to the uh, former prime minister. But the simple fact of the matter is, I judge him on the facts that I know for certain. What I know is he's had an incredibly successful career. He's been um, uh, he's got huge experience. Uh, delivering at the top of large organisations and in the conversations that I've had with him about the BBC World Service, mm -hmm. he's been clearly very, very thoughtful, um, listened to the points that I made, uh, made you know his points about the BBC very firmly and, uh, and, you, and, and you've made that return. point and we should and tell our really viewers showed, this morning yeah, and it really that showed that he was the, sorry? And we've, we've we should tell our viewers this morning, we asked Mr Sharp if he wanted to come and speak to us and he declined that opportunity, but he has said that the claim that there was anything financial involved in this is not true. But we just heard there Foreign Secretary Ian Duncan Smith say it would be better if your colleague Nadim Zahawi just got everything out in the open. So in the spirit of getting everything out in the open, can you confirm to our viewers this morning that he has paid a penalty to the taxman? Well, I don't know any more detail than... The, uh, the, the, the detail that he's put out in his statement. In the UK system, people's tax affairs are personal and uh, private. I recognise, as politicians, there is quite rightly an enhanced duty for uh, openness. Um, I, you know, I think Ian makes a very, very firm point that actually sometimes it is, or you know, typically it is, it is best to say everything that you are uh, going to say uh, up front. But I do think the point we should remember is that the, you know, the, the tax requirement that fell on Nadim was as a direct result of him being a very successful entrepreneur who built a business from nothing that went on to employ hundreds, I think possibly even uh, thousands of people. Uh, he paid tax, the business paid tax, the individuals he employed paid tax. Paid tax. So you know, he, he has been a, uh, you know, a real contributor direct contributor to the British economy. But of course, you know, he will realise that, that, that having conversations like this are far from what he would But Foreign Secretary, uh, what he people don't want. pay, say, our viewers detail, don't, I don't know pay their tax. The Foreign Secretary, our viewers don't pay their tax depending on whether or not they're successful. It's dependent on how much they've earned. But you've said you don't know if he paid a penalty. I'll ask you another question. Did he sort out this dispute while he was the Chancellor and therefore the boss of the taxman? Laura, as I said, I don't know any more detail about this than what was in Nadim's uh, statement. Uh, but as I say, uh, this, was, this was something which um, uh, has been described as um, uh, careless rather than intentional. Uh, and the, uh, the tax uh, requirement, the tax um, uh, that he was due to pay has now been fully paid. We, as we should again point out to our viewers, the word careless in this context doesn't mean, oh, whoops, I lost my tax return down the back of the sofa. That is a technical term used by the taxman to say that something went wrong. I've got another question for you. You say you haven't asked for any more detail, you don't know any more detail, but did the Prime Minister know about this before he gave Nadim Zahawi a job in his government? Well, Nadim uh, was... Uh, a senior member of uh, of cabinet. Uh, when you when you when you, you know, join cabinet, the the cabinet office uh, ensures that you go through a you know, a process, uh, a due diligence process. Uh, that is the right and proper role of the cabinet office. Nadim said that he had conversations with the cabinet office about his uh, tax affairs, uh, and of course that is that is their job. That is their function on behalf of but did the, the prime, minister uh, prime minister. Know? I don't I don't know. You don't know. So I don't know what conversations the, I don't know what conversations the Prime Minister had on the appointment of any other minister. But All I know is the conversations that I had with the Prime Minister when he appointed me. I'm sure that is reflective of the conversations he had with others. And in those conversations, you talk about the priorities for the government, the priorities of the country, and what we need to do in our jobs as minister rather than our rather than um, uh, any external affairs. Those are the conversations when I've been appointed a minister that I have had and I suspect that is the same for other ministers in government. But Foreign Secretary, this story, this issue has been going on for a long time. It's been a huge matter of political discussion in the last few days. You knew you were coming on to do this interview this morning and you've told us you don't know whether or not he paid a penalty. You don't know whether he sorted out his tax affairs while he was the chancellor, when he was actually the tax man's boss, which I think many people would think is a blatant conflict of interest. And you don't know whether he discussed it with the prime minister. Can I ask you, is that because you don't want to know because it's uncomfortable to talk about this? 
or if it's because Nadim Zahawi is keeping, him, keeping this to himself. Because our viewers might wonder, how on earth are you here talking for the government about this this morning when you don't have answers to what are really straightforward questions? Well, because, Laura, I spent the whole of uh, last week in the United States of America and in Canada, having on Monday just made a statement about the execution of a British dual national by the brutal Iranian regime. I arrived uh, back in the UK early on, uh, <clears throat> early on Friday morning uh, on an overnight flight before then going on to engage with my constituents uh, through Friday and uh, having a bit of a, a bit of a rest and doing some shopping on Saturday. So uh, my week has been focused on the, uh, the UK support for the people of Ukraine, the UK support for British nationals overseas and trying to um, ensure <coughs> that that I deliver on my function, which is to be the face and voice this morning of the UK that overseas. Foreign Secretary is a very busy job and those are all important issues that you raised there, apart from maybe doing your shopping, but I'm sure your family was sure, uh, glad that you managed to squeeze that in. But this has been a serious matter of political conversation and debate in the last few days. Don't you think the public has a right actually to these answers? It's about a senior minister in the government getting in a mess over millions of pounds to the tax man. It's not some random obscure issue. No, no, no. And as, as I said, I recognise that we have an enhanced duty of transparency when we are in elected office. And that is right and that is proper. Um, and so why doesn't he uh, Nadim his tax has and why made... doesn't he get it all out so, there? Wouldn't that just be better? Then people can see, as Ian Duncan Smith has suggested, then everyone can look. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, they say, because this at the moment doesn't stack up with Rishi Sunak's promise, does it? He said he would run a government with the highest levels of integrity, professionalism and accountability. And he said that transparency is vital to a healthy democracy. And here we have only part of the story. Why not get it all out there? Well, the decision as to how much detail to put in the public domain is rightly one for Nadim uh, himself. Um, and the point that he has made um, is that he is up to date with his tax affairs upon appointment to um, uh, positions in government. He had, as we all do, conversations with the Cabinet Office to make sure that um, you know, we, we, we give that due diligence or we give that reassurance to the government as a whole that um, our personal affairs are right and proper and if there was something outstanding uh, at any point that those things are in the process of being resolved. The choice as to how much detail to put in the uh, public domain, as I say, is ultimately one for Nadim Zahawi. Um, but personally, in terms of what I know about this, I don't know any more than the statement that he has made. OK, well, our viewers will make their own conclusions about how much of this story is really, really out there. But thank you for um, answering questions on that. I want to ask you about a really important issue that you're grappling with as Foreign Secretary. Lots of viewers will know that this week there was a lot of discussion among allies, Western allies, about sending more tanks to Ukraine. Now, Germany mm. did not agree either to send their own tanks or to allow German tanks to be sent <coughs> to Ukraine by other allies. Are you disappointed by that? Because surely it drags out the length of this terrible conflict. Well, over Christmas and the New Year, um, I, I had conversations with the Defence Secretary, with uh, the Prime Minister, other senior members of government about our posture with regard to Ukraine. And the Prime Minister decided quite rightly that the most humane thing to do is to bring this conclusion uh, is to bring this war to a swift conclusion for the Ukrainians to be successful in the defense of their homeland that is why we made the commitment to significantly increase our defensive uh, sorry our military support to Ukraine to help them defend ourselves themselves including with challenger 2 tanks i would like nothing more than to see the Ukrainians equipped with those most up-to-date uh, armored vehicles both tanks and artillery uh, and others the leopard 2 is an incredibly uh, effective piece of uh, military equipment. I would like nothing more to see the Ukrainians armed with Leopard 2s. And are you twos. frustrated that Germany that has is... not done that? I mean, you said there the humane thing was to help as much as possible to bring this to a close. Now, the suggestion from that is that it's inhumane, actually, to hold back that military support. Are you frustrated, disappointed that Germany still has the brakes on sending those tanks? 
Well, Germany has been a huge contributor, and I don't think we should uh, ignore that, both in terms of uh, its hosting of refugees, in terms of its provision of military equipment, uh, uh, economic aid, uh, and also in terms of its application of sanctions. Ultimately, it's for every sovereign government to decide how they are best able to support the Ukrainians uh, as, a, uh, as a member of uh, NATO. Um, the Ramstein process is about coordinating our respective uh, support. Uh, the Ukrainians said that they need and want tanks and they need uh, Western um, uh, calibre uh, NATO standard uh, tanks. We provided uh, some Challenger 2s, um, but, but countries across NATO have provided a range of uh, armoured vehicles um, and some of that includes uh, light tanks and some of that includes uh, significant uh, artillery. Uh, we will continue working with our friends and allies uh, across NATO to make sure that the support we give to uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people are the most effective at helping them defend themselves against this brutal invasion. Foreign Secretary, reading between the lines, it sounds like you are rather frustrated with your Germans, but you are too polite perhaps to say so. Um, can we close just with a yes or no question, if I may? Would it be easier in this country if all ministers published their tax returns so there was never any of these kinds of arguments? Yes or no? Well, I think it's right and proper that people's tax affairs are personal and private. As I said, I think as politicians, so no. quite rightly, we have an enhanced duty. Well, look, I, I think uh, we we keep hearing that we want uh, we want politicians to you know to uh, to be more like the rest of us and and less uh, uh, to be a kind of a strange uh, and unique beasts. Um, so I think that you know, the rules that we apply to others, I think it's legitimate to also apply to politicians. Okay. Um, and that is why, as I say, we, we don't demand it of others. Uh, and if, if politicians choose to do so, that's great. But I think having a unique requirement that is different to the rest of society, I don't think that would necessarily okay, be that's the best a no. way Foreign Secretary, thank you so much for joining us this morning and giving us your time. Thanks very much indeed. Well, Ian Duncan-Smith, what did you make of that? Well, it's difficult <coughs> to come on a programme like this in the midst of something like that. I've done it myself. You're having to drop a dead bat on everything else. It's very difficult. I think the main point, uh, though, is uh, to take away from this is that it's very important that the, the, the correct bits of the story are there. Mm -hmm. Now, I, from what I've read, mm -hmm. uh, this is a little more complex than sometimes we make out. These were family shares, not his. He has not benefited from any of this, this is now clear. Mm -hmm. And, and these areas are very complex mm -hmm. uh, when they're about what is relevant to the individual and how much to tax. So there you, will have been ongoing mm -hmm. conversations for some time but with HMRC okay about what is owed and what is not owed. But it's okay, for, to, as far as you're concerned, that he was having <coughs> these conversations or his accountants were on his behalf while he was mm -hmm. Chancellor. I mean, John Allen, you're a senior businessman. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're the tax man's boss, mm -hmm. you're also talking to the tax man about your own tax bill. <coughs> Yes, I'm, I'm, but I'm not, I don't really have a view on that, uh, Laura. What I do have a view on mm. is that these sorts of scandals and scandalettes, and I think we've got a kind of scandal and a scandalette this morning, uh, are hugely distracting. Mm. I endorse what Ian said earlier. The best way of dealing with this is to get it all out in the open because, frankly, this will haunt ministers for days and weeks mm until it is fully disclosed mm -hmm. and it's distracting them and us mm -hmm. from the massive issues mm -hmm. that this country and faces he could have domestically it all up this morning. domestically and internationally but he could Rachel Johnson have cleared all of this up this morning by coming with with, with answers that he said he, he he didn't have well the bit that puzzles me about the whole thing is that if you've built up as Ian was saying a fantastically successful British company from scratch and then you sell it presumably you've got a you know, white hot accountant, especially if you're in politics and you're, or you're intending to go into politics, who makes sure that something like this doesn't come mm -hmm. and take up everybody's time and attention and, dis mm -hmm. and distracts the entire agenda for mm -hmm. days on end. Um, you know, when the government's trying to get on with things. Well, talking... But especially, as you say, when he was Chancellor and actually was the boss of HMRC. What then about this, um, I think what you referred to as a scandalette, I think, to your mm -hmm. short term about Richard Sharp, the chair mm -hmm. of the BBC, and 1B Johnson. Now, if yours haven't been following this, Richard Sharp, the chair of the BBC, appointed by the government. He was appointed by Boris Johnson's government. The claim in the Sunday Times this morning is that he set up a meeting between a wealthy uh, businessman and a senior civil servant, and the claim is that that was to discuss financial support and backing for uh, the former prime minister. Do you 
fear that this just again creates more murk and more mess around your brother's time <laughs> in number 10? Oh, Laura, you ask uh, about my distant cousin and my brother. I mean, look, I mean, I'm happy to tell you, I have no, uh, I have no prior or privy knowledge, thank goodness, of my brother's financial affairs. I had no idea about this until the Sunday Times, I think, broke it last week mm. that there had been. Late last night, yeah. No, no, this was a week ago. This is a follow-up. Oh, the initial what, stage, the, the yes. Richard Sharp involvement <laughs> is a follow-up to last week's story, which was the, the, a loan provided by my distant mm. cousin. Um, all the parties involved have given um, statements to the Sunday Times, mm. which suggest they did everything above board and everything was transparent. I suggest you ask Sir Simon Case, who seems to be the linchpin in both these stories to come on and say what happened and give, so make him the do cabinet a tick. Secretary yeah, who's the cabinet secretary who obviously was the cabinet secretary during Nadim Zahawi's time also was the one that Richard Sharp properly said should be involved if any such introduction was made between him and, and I'm probably on a hiding Sam. to nothing but I'll say also for <laughs> transparency we'd be delighted to have Simon Case yeah. or indeed uh, yeah. Boris Johnson in the yeah. studio any Sunday morning they fancy coming on or even during the week we'd be happy to go and film an interview with him and then play it to all of you um, any week that's going but do you think that this matters because again it is a thing in Duncan Smith for the Conservative Party whatever the specific rights and wrongs of these individual stories and there are of course technical and legal details involved and as Rachel said people have denied that anything was wrong here but again People are hearing about what sound like things that, you know, just fail the sniff test for the Conservative Party and wasn't Rishi Sunak's government meant to draw a line under all of that? Yeah, it's, it's difficult uh, for the Prime Minister because, of course, <clears throat> this distracts from what he's trying to do, no question. Stories off like this are not helpful mm -hmm. because they gain a significance that they don't really have mm -hmm. in real government. So he wants these to go away, mm. uh, and the quicker he can get them to go away, the better. The Boris Johnson stuff on the loan, I know nothing at all about. Mm -hmm. I suspect Rishi Sunak knows nothing at all about it either. Mm -hmm. And that's not from within government, and that's still damaging because it was the Prime Minister. The government one ha will have to be dealt with uh, in, in, uh, in another way. But my sense is that the sooner we can get beyond this, there are so many huge issues you touched on mm. Ukraine, you've got the whole issue about uh, inflation and the cost of living, which uh, we were talking about earlier on. So these are the big issues that the public really, really care about because they affect them. These other stories are just indicative of uh, if you're not careful, a loss of control. So getting those under control is critical. Well, you raise the cost of living there, and I want to show our viewers a, a story in a grabby headline in the mail this morning, which talks about greedflation, John Allen. And it basically mm -hmm. accuses some of the big food companies mm -hmm. of profiteering. So we know that businesses have been under pressure because of inflation. But one of the examples it gives is a humble tin of soup has gone up from 98p to £1.70. Now, who better to ask than the head of a big supermarket chain that millions of us use every week? Do you think that some of the big producers and food companies have been <clears throat> taking the mick? Well, I'm not sure I'd use those terms, but I know that there have been very robust discussions between Tesco and a number of suppliers. We, were, we didn't have Heinz soup and Heinz tomato ketchup for a spell last summer when they tried to put through a large... Uh, price increase at that stage that was eventually settled we've fallen out with other suppliers so we do try very hard I think to challenge and we have a team who can look at the composition of food costs of commodities and work out whether or not these uh, cost increases so are legitimate so I, I think most of them are mm -hmm. because there have been some dramatic increases in commodity costs energy costs and labor costs on the other hand you know if you don't want to pay one pound seventy for uh, hind soup in Tesco or any other supermarket, mm -hmm. there are own label alternatives. Cross and Blackwell, for instance, at less than a but pound. That's very so there are alternatives. So, so you are acknowledging there that actually some companies have been trying to take advantage of the rise in inflation to jack up prices more than they really needed to. I think that's entirely possible. Very interesting. And do you think that's something that is still going on? Are you worried about it? Well, it's something that our buying teams try to deal with every day of the week and sometimes we succeed in turning these things back mm -hmm. sometimes we don't but I think until you can get into the cost structures of the people concerned it's very difficult to be definitive about it mm -hmm. but I think it's the extent to which food prices have risen is uncomfortable 
and certainly the major supermarket chains, and I think Tesco is not alone in this, mm -hmm. are trying very hard to mitigate those increases, so not least by offering people alternatives. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt at all that people are trading down from brands to own brand and even to our lowest tier prices. But at this moment in a cost of living crisis, you're saying that some big companies have been taking advantage then of some of the poorest people in the country. They may well have. I'm not, I can't be definitive because I haven't seen their cost structures. But you've definitely been considering this as an issue, which yeah. is mm -hmm. something that you've been dealing with mm. as a business. I, I want very briefly to ask you all about something completely different, which is also in lots of the newspapers, which is the coronation. There are some glorious pictures of what the coronation might look like in the newspapers. <laughs> and of course, people have seen so much of the archive, the late Queen's coronation um, over the last few months. Speculation too about what it might look like, who might play, will it be Brian May again on top of Buckingham Palace? I want to know who you would all like to see. Ian Duncan Smith. Oh, well, <clears throat> anybody that uh, people want to be entertained by. I'm, I'm an old rocker, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would happily see. Yep, I'd happily see any of the old rock bands come through. You're an Stones. old rocker. There's a there's yeah. a new old fact old for a Sunday <laughs> morning. Uh, How about if, if Ian's an old rocker? What about Pink Floyd? Because uh, no, no, no. was it 50 years ago they recorded Dark Side of the Moon and it hasn't gone out of the charts? There we go. Well, that's a decent recommendation. Myself, You'd have the Rolling Stones. <laughs> well, maybe you oh, can. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, maybe at the very Both. end, John, we'll ask you your recommendation would be. But I think we've got Pink Floyd the Rolling Stones and maybe Ian Duncan Smith is an old rocker. Did you ever play yourself? <laughs> Think about no that for now. <laughs> so, last week we spoke to Keir Starmer who told me he didn't want to be Prime Minister when he was a child, although he certainly does now. The week before we spoke to the Prime Minister, the youngest person in that job in a very long time. Now we'll hear from Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister, in the latest of our leaders' interviews to get us off to a good start in 2023. We sat down in her official residence in Edinburgh, Butte House, and although, as you'd expect, she wanted to contrast the performance of the government in Edinburgh and Westminster, she is also having to deal with strikes and the problems in the struggling health service too. Here she is. Yes, education is the foundation of so much of everything that a country then achieves. And Scotland has challenges in education like many other countries, but we are seeing an narrowing of the attainment gap. Crucially, we're now seeing record numbers from our most deprived communities go into a higher education, go to university. So lots of work still to do, but lots uh, of progress that has been made. If it's still your number one priority, though, how have you therefore allowed a situation to develop where families and children at the moment are not able to go to school all the time because of a series of rolling strikes that's causing havoc? We're not simply digging our heels in and refusing to negotiate, as we often see with the UK government. Uh, so we are seeking an agreement with teachers. Of course, COSLA, our local authority organisation, is also part of the, the tripartite negotiations that we have with the teaching profession. So teachers in Scotland are the best paid on average in the UK. Since 2018, teachers have had more than 20% increase in their salary. And well, right now, can I finish the point? Right now, they're, can, they, like they're being offered a pay increase for next year that is equivalent in terms of percentage uplift to that already accepted by janitors and you know dinner men and ladies in our schools. So we're trying to achieve fairness. Uh, but there has been further discussion in recent days as we speak right now, there is a, a further meeting of the negotiating body underway. And I hope we can see some further compromise that reaches the kind of agreement that we've been able to reach with other groups of public sector but workers. Would you like to pay teachers more? And do you think you will have to pay teachers more in um, order to sort this dispute out? Because I, I, I hear what you're saying. You're saying you're trying to be fair. But the fact is, at the moment, the significant disruption for families sure, look, and pupils. I, so would I like to pay teachers more? Yes. Would I like to pay probably all public sector workers more, yes. In Scotland, many public sector workers are paid more than their counterparts elsewhere in the UK. Take the NHS, uh, the offer for this year on average is 7.5% in Scotland compared to 4.5% in England and Wales. Teachers, well, I'll come back to teachers. Teachers are already higher paid on average than their counterparts elsewhere in the UK. But experienced teachers in Scotland would say that they're lagging behind their counterparts in England. It is true the starting salaries are more generous, but that's not necessarily true I think right across different, the board. Different but what, I'm, what I'm asking you about, though, is what you're going to do to sort these strikes well, out. It's not about making comparisons we're, we're going, to other parts of the UK. Well, these comparisons are illustrative, but we are uh, working to resolve these disputes. So we managed to resolve the dispute in ScotRail so that the strikes that happened here were not to do with a dispute with the Scottish Government or with ScotRail. We have avoided industrial action in the National Health Service and we're working to 
uh, stop industrial action with teachers. But, but, let me, but also let me these say, are all questions, just as they are for the government in Cardiff, Westminster yeah, sure. and here in Edinburgh. It's all a matter of political choice. So if you wanted to pay teachers more to get these strikes resolved, if you wanted to commit to paying nurses more in order that strike action does not take place, you could make political we, choices to spend less on other things. We that, are I'm not saying you should, that that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing no, to but, do, but, can but I, you do can have I choices. Because I think that is a really fair question. You're, you're right to say it's about choices and we are making those choices, but we don't have all of the levers, nor, nor does Mark, Mark Drakeford in Wales, mm -hmm. that the UK government and the Treasury currently have. Do you think the NHS in Scotland is in crisis? I, my job is not to describe it. Yes, I think if you are uh, working in the NHS, I think for some patients who are waiting too long for treatment, that's uh, how it will feel right now. Uh, the vast majority of patients in NHS Scotland get excellent care and very timely care, but recently too many patients have not had that. We're starting to see, thankfully, an easing of some of the winter pressure. So we've had an improvement over uh, recent days in accident emergency uh, waiting times, for example. So we are working to support the health service through these pressures. Your party's been in charge here in Butte House for 16 years. And during that time, the problems of the NHS have got worse. The situation has been exacerbated. So what do you say to people who've looked at what's happening in the health service in Scotland in the last few months and thought, how on earth have we allowed it to get to this situation? Um, well, I think in many respects, the standard and quality of health care over these years you talk about has improved. We've had a, a three-year pandemic that has exacerbated issues, lots of reform and improvement in how we deliver health care changing the way people who call for emergency care uh, will, will be treated. So there's lots of improvements and changes, but there are significant pressures. Roughly the same number of people are having to wait 12 hours in A&E <coughs> now as did in 2016. Yeah. Now, as a government, if you look at that, that's not progress, is it? That's dreadful. No, but, but Laura, to be fair, and I think any minister, probably in any country across the world sitting here, would, would remind you that there's something quite significant happened between 2016 and today. Uh, a global pandemic that has put significant pressure on all parts of our were health there service. Long before the pandemic, though, first no, well, But if, if I take the pre pandemic period, yes, we had a situation where waiting times were in. Increasing, um, and, but in the immediately pre-pandemic uh, period, and you know, I can furnish you with statistics. We were starting to reduce waiting times through a range of initiatives and, and funding that we were applying to that. I, I think it is perhaps not entirely fair to compare as if we're comparing like with like 2016 and today. So if you take 12 hour waits, nobody should have to wait 12 hours in an accident, in emergency, and the vast majority of people don't wait anywhere near that. I'd like to ask you about the Gender Recognition Act. Right now, trans adults in Scotland who want to have help sometimes have to wait for as long as four yeah. years to get the right Absolutely. kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable? No, it's not acceptable. The, the, the issue around the process uh, by which a trans person ca can get a gender recognition certificate has attracted all of the attention on these issues because we've been putting legislation through Parliament, but there are a wider range of issues for trans people and access to support and treatment uh, for those who want to go through uh, certain processes uh, is another of these areas. So if, it's, need to... if it's not acceptable, you know, you're in charge oh, of that as part of the well, Scottish Health again, Service. Are, we, Why have we you allowed are, a situation to develop where we people are, have to wait four years? We are, again, that will not be unique to Scotland, but it's not acceptable and I'm responsible for Scotland. So we are taking steps to invest more in these services, to improve these services, to reduce waiting times. Why do you believe that you are old enough at the age of 16 to make a, a profound decision about changing your gender? when you're not old enough, according to the law, to buy a pint in the pub, to drive a car, the law doesn't treat you fully as an adult in the same that you, way you would when it comes to all sorts of different things. So why well, in Scotland, at 16 well, are you I, old enough? You, you can take a view as to whether you think what I'm about to say is right or wrong. I, I accept that. And I'm that. not saying it's right but or wrong. But in Scotland right now, you, you can choose to get married uh, and, and have a child. You can join the army. Additional measures were amended into the legislation so that there is uh, greater advice and support available to what would be a tiny number of, of people of that age group wanting to go through this process. When I was growing up and probably 16, used to take the view that there should be a single age of consent. And I, I think over time, I think it is right to look at why can't a 16-year-old you know, drink alcohol in uh, a pub, there, you, you need to look at the particular circumstances, the, uh, the, the physical issues around some of these things. So but, the, but the point I'm making, and this is, all of these issues in Scotland have been, you know, in 
detail, and this is legislation that has probably been subject to more scrutiny than any other piece of legislation that the Scottish Parliament has passed in almost 25 years. Some women's groups feel they were not listened to carefully enough, who do have a concern that a tiny minority of predatory men could take advantage of the way that the rules have been changed to the detriment of biological women who are biologically female at birth. If their worst fears are realised, do you and the politicians who have voted for this potentially bear some responsibility for that? Look, politicians bear responsibility for any legislation they pass and, and the consequences of that. So, of course, I don't believe that will be the case. We tried very hard to listen carefully to all views in the two consultations that were held on this legislation. You know, some of the, the groups that work closest with women that are subject to uh, violence uh, by predatory men, domestic violence, uh, Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, Women's Aid Scotland, Zero Tolerance Scotland, these are groups that work with vulnerable women mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. These organisations support this legislation, so it's important to be clear. Yes, there are some that do that. and some that don't. Well, actually, most of the, the, the key women's organisations in Scotland do support this legislation. The fear that women have about predatory men accessing women only spaces to abuse and attack women is very real. Women's, you don't have to show your birth certificate to access women's only spaces. So the point is, this bill does not give a predatory man any more ability to abuse women than that predatory man already has. The UK government contends that your legislation does have a big impact on the Equality Act that protects rights across the UK for all sorts of different groups. Are they wrong? Yes, they're wrong. Can I just add perhaps a, an introductory point here about this supposed clash? When we first put forward this proposal, the UK government had exactly the same plans. Under Theresa May, the UK government was planning to do exactly the same. So the fact that we've ended up in a policy divergent position is not because the Scottish government has changed its, its mind on this, it's because the UK government changed its mind. You say there is no effect on the Equalities Act. The Nobody legal has, opinion on that is well, divided. Well, well, the legal opinion on most things in my experience right, is divided. So div but that's the point, it is divided. There are different opinions, so you cannot be categoric that it has no impact on the Equalities Act. Well, I, and therefore, actually, has... isn't it the right thing to put the brake on, press pause while this all gets sorted out? Well, but the Scottish Parliament considers all of that on every legislation that it, it passes. And I have not heard any argument about the impact on the Equality Act uh, that I find in any way persuasive or, or compelling, because the Act does not change the legal effect of uh, a gender recognition certificate. Um, what the UK government has done is just veto it, an instruction to the presiding officer that the bill can't be sent for royal assent. So if the argument of the UK government was that there's an issue that needs to be decided in court, the route they have chosen to take doesn't actually do that. They are exercising, Secretary of State exercising some kind of governor general like power to block a democratic decision that the Scottish Parliament is Well, actually, taken. it's one elected government, is it not? taking a decision to block something that another elected government has chosen to do in accordance with the law. I mean, you, you don't like it, but well, Section 35 I, I, I said, is set out there as something that the UK government well, can do. Well, I said do. earlier on, when we started this, uh, the UK government was also consulting on a similar proposal. 2018, you can go back and look at that. In that consultation, the UK government said the issue of gender recognition is devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Scotland can have a separate system uh, if it so chooses. What, what has changed about that. They did not raise these concerns mm -hmm. uh, with us directly during the uh, the process of this bill. They wait till after so, the Scottish Parliament's passed it and they exercise so, so not what, something to take it to court, but a veto. It's outrageous. So and what it's are you going principle. to do? So, so what are you going to do? Can you confirm that you're going to seek a judicial review? Um, I've already said we will do everything to uh, stand up for and defend the legislation. The UK government are doing this for two reasons. And frankly, it's got nothing to do with concerns about the Equality Act. Firstly, shamefully, disgracefully, they're trying to stoke a culture war on the back of one of the most vulnerable groups in our society because they somehow think that plays well with their, their base well, ahead of the general election. they would, of course, election. dispute that very strongly, they would dispute Minister, it, but, but you can get, other people you can get them on to dispute it. I know that, right? but they're stoking a culture war. And secondly, this is part of a pattern of undermining and delegitimising, seeking to undermine and delegitimise the Scottish Parliament. So the issues are really important, and I feel very strongly uh, that 
trans people should not be weaponised. And this is just one of many controversial issues you've dealt with in your extraordinary time. You know, you've had extraordinary electoral success year after year. Do you still think you're the leader who's going to take Scotland to independence? <laughs> I, I would like to think so. I think Scotland's going to be independent. I would, of course, I mean, I, nobody would believe me if I said, no, I'd, I'd rather it was somebody else. But for me, who the leader is that takes Scotland to independence is less important than that Scotland completes But do you feel that it will still be you? Um, yes, I do. Jacinda Ardern said she doesn't have enough in the tank to continue. How much is in the Nicola Sturgeon's tank? There's time? plenty in the tank uh, at the moment. If I ever, I don't mean just on a single day, everybody wakes up some days and thinks they don't have enough in the tank, but if I ever reach the point, which she has clearly reached, where I think overall I, I just can't give the job everything it deserves, then I hope I have the same courage she's had in saying, OK, this is the point to go. But just for the avoidance of all doubt, I don't feel anywhere near that right now. Nowhere near? Nowhere near. Very interesting. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. <laughs> now, as ever, we'd love to know what you think about that and everything we've been discussing today. As ever, you can email us, coonsberg at bbc.co.uk. Use the hashtag BBCLauraK on social media if you're that way inclined. And there is tons on the BBC News website, including the live page, which has analysis during and after the programme. And I'll be writing there a bit later on. Now, for all the constitutional clashes, the tricky questions about ministers and tax bills, we know the priority for many, of course, is paying the bills. Prices may be rising a touch less slowly, but they're still heading up and up. Labour hopes its fortunes are heading up and up too. But would the party really be able to take the pressure off the rest of us if they win the next election and also pay its way? Rachel Reeves is the shadow chancellor who wants the keys to number 11. Um, welcome to you. It's good to have you in the studio. Good um, morning. First of all, do you think that all politicians and certainly all ministers should just publish their tax returns? Would that be more straightforward? I'll be very relaxed uh, about that. But we've got a situation now in um, the Conservative Party where you've got the chairman, who used to be the chancellor, who it looks like has been fined a million pounds or more for not paying his taxes. You've got a deputy prime minister who's being investigated for bullying claims. And you've got a former prime minister who it is alleged had his extravagant lifestyle funded by a donor who was facilitated by the current chairman of the BBC, who instantly got that job just after facilitating that arrangement. Now, we but should we don't be clear know. that they've denied that anything went wrong in that whole scenario. Yeah, but no one but... seemed to think there was any need to declare uh, anything in terms of conflicts of interest. And, and Laura, you've got a prime minister who is too weak to do anything about it. And it's going to take an incoming Labour government to clean up this mess, drain the swamp, because frankly, it stinks. Drain the swamp is pretty inflammatory language. I mean, you say you're relaxed about publishing tax returns, but would you then, as a Labour government, would you be very different and say everybody who gets to the Cabinet has to put all their tax affairs out in the open? Would you make that commitment? I I'm, would be very relaxed about but would doing you? that. It's not the same as being relaxed about doing it. Would you do it? Well, I would be happy to, to do that if that was the uh, feeling what was, was necessary. But the problem about Nadim Zahawi, the mm. former Chancellor who was in charge of the tax man uh, when he potentially um, came to this uh, uh, arrangement. The problem with him is that if he had published his taxes, there wouldn't have been very much to be seen because he wasn't paying them. But so that, of, that is the problem here. But in terms of how your approach might be different, should the shadow cabinet right now publish their tax returns and then the public could really compare and contrast and could see exactly how, th how things are? But honestly, I wouldn't have a problem with publishing my tax um, return. It's a pretty straightforward uh, document, uh, uh, unlike it seems some people who are running the government at the moment. OK, well, straightforward documents are not right now many people's energy bills. Often people look at their energy bills or they get they look at them on their phone and actually are horrified by what's going on. Mm. The government has provided billions of pounds of support to people on that, but it's due to be reduced in Easter. Now, you're saying that Labour would carry on giving people money to help with their energy bills at the current level, but how long would you keep going on with that? Wouldn't there have to be a limit? 
Well, what I set out this weekend is how we would stop bills going up in April. At the moment, they're due to go up from an average of £2,500 to £3,000. But most people just haven't got the money to pay that uh, additional amount in their energy bills, which is why uh, Labour have said, Keir Starmer and myself have said, that we would expand the windfall tax on the huge profits that the energy giants are making. And we would use that money to cap those bills and also to help people on prepayment meetings. Mm. who are currently paying more for their energy than those who pay for direct by de direct debits and also uh, uh, put a moratorium on this thing that's happening at the moment of energy companies moving people mm. from um, regular payments to prepayment meters which is effectively cutting some people off from heating at a time when this week uh, temperatures fell below zero and I'll this ask is you just totally unacceptable under labor it wouldn't happen and I'll ask you about the wind ta windfall tax in a second but while people watching this morning might think oh well great if Labour want to carry on giving more money towards bills but surely you'd have to put a limit on for how long you could do that because Rachel Reeves you spent a lot of time in the last few months telling the public you'd keep an iron grip on the public finances that you can't just go around writing mm. big checks and so I what would never. the limit mm -hmm. be what, what would the limit be on how long you're going to keep paying energy, keep helping people with bills? Well, I will never make a spending commitment without telling you where the money mm -hmm. is going to come from. What we have announced this weekend is a further three months of the cap of £2,500. But after but if, that, if well, energy bills yeah. were still at the level they're at, would you just so keep going? If you look at the forecasts for where um, energy prices are going, it looks like hopefully they're starting to come down. So that's why we've made a commitment for uh, three months. But we think we could raise an additional £13 billion pounds through the windfall tax and this announcement that I've made about freezing uh, the price cap at two and a half thousand pounds mm -hmm. for a further three months um, costs a fraction but of anything that around could three, happen in um, those three billion. months I mean everybody hopes that the conflicts in Ukraine comes to an end there's not much sign of that as we've been discussing with yeah. James cleverly this morning what happens then at the end of three months do you, would you just keep going and keep going. Well, we've always going. said that we would look at it depending on what's happening to, uh, to oil, gas, and electricity prices. At the moment, those forecasts look like they're coming down, which is why we've said two and a half thousand pounds should be a, a maximum. And if those um, prices fall, then that should be reflected in people's bills. But you know what you've got is you've got on one side these huge profits that mm -hmm. oil and gas companies, energy companies, are making. On the other side, you've got these huge bills. Mm -hmm. um, as the oil and gas prices come down, so those windfall profits will come down, but also so must people's bills. But it's not as simple as that, is it, though, when you come to the windfall tax? So some big energy companies are warning that actually pumping more from them in windfall taxes would lead to people losing their jobs. Now, Shell, huge company, they've said that they're thinking again about £25 billion worth of investment in the UK, which Labour would argue investment is desperately needed in this country. Harbour Energy, which is an oil and gas company, say that they're going to have to shed jobs because of the effects of the government's existing windfall tax. So with a windfall tax isn't some kind of free cash machine that you can just keep going to without any consequences. Well, the chief executive of BP has said that mm -hmm. a windfall tax wouldn't affect their investment decisions. But other companies say it would let, let's, and already let's is. Let's look at why we're proposing a windfall tax and um, mm -hmm. why we have been for more than a year now. Mm -hmm. It's because they are windfalls of war. Those profits are being enjoyed mm -hmm. because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has pushed up mm -hmm. uh, prices. And it's right to capture that because it's not because of the ingenuity of, of the firms that they've enjoyed those profits. And the government's already the taking a lot, uh, actually. Invasion. They don't use the phrase windfall tax, but no, the government's already, already taking a lot mm -hmm. from those excess profits. But do you acknowledge knowledge at the very least that there might be a downside because you quote BP I can say that Shell have already said that there's a warning around it and another company Harbour Energy saying they're going to have to shed jobs because of the windfall tax already what's the point helping people pay with their bills if if they work in the energy sector in Aberdeen for example they might get more help on their bills but lose the job well you look at previous examples of windfall taxes whether that was uh, Labour's windfall tax on the privatized utilities in 1997 whether it was George Osborne or Margaret Thatcher's uh, windfall taxes on oil and gas profits and you didn't see 
mm. those falls in investment. I've looked at all the evidence. I believe that this is the right thing to do. But look, we've got to go beyond this sticking plaster uh, approach uh, of just uh, coming in and putting huge amounts of money to fix problems. That's why mm. also this weekend I set out more detail on Labour's ambitions to get to clean power mm. by 2030, but also bring the 19 million homes in Britain mm. that don't meet the basic energy performance level um, up to the right standard. Because if you do those things, you don't just save people a few hundred pounds on the bills for one year, mm -hmm. you can save £1,400 off people's bills every year. And, and that is why that would be a priority as part of the Green Prosperity Plan mm -hmm. for an incoming Labour and government. And I'm sure we'll talk about that on another occasion. But you've also had a busy week being in Davos. Now, our viewers might not know, but Davos is a sort of annual get-together of plutocrats, chief executives and politicians from around the world. I think we can see a picture of you and Keir Starmer there. You're there in your snow boots. Um, I didn't I think wear them today. You didn't <laughs> wear them today. I think some people might, in your party might look at that, the sort of images of your party leader and your shadow chancellor at Davos rubbing shoulders with essentially the sort of global financial 1% and kind of wince at that a bit. What would you say to them? Well, what I would say is that um, in the last few years, um, investment into Britain has fallen. Uh, our exports uh, have taken a, a hit mm -hmm. and our growth and productivity have been on the floor. And Keir Starmer and myself want to say, with an incoming Labour government, Britain would be very much open for business. We want investment in the UK, in the industries of the future. you don't have to go to Davos to do well, that. Well, actually... I mean, to go and hang out with all these kinds the of The World people. Economic Forum in, in Davos is a great opportunity to meet um, uh, global leaders, uh, to meet our opposite numbers. Uh, Keir Starmer met Leo Varadka. Uh, I met um, uh, representatives from the German Treasury. That's incredibly important to have those opportunities, as well as meeting international investors and British business, uh, to set out Labour's uh, plans for clean power by 2030 to encourage investment into Britain. And, and I think this is really important because mm -hmm. there's a global race going on for mm -hmm. the industries of the future. President Biden is putting a huge bet on carbon capture and storage, on mm -hmm. uh, electric vehicles. The European Union is doing the same. Mm -hmm. And Grant Shapps, the business secretary in Davos this week, said that those things were dangerous. Well, I'll tell you what is dangerous. It's sitting on the sidelines carping while other governments are taking the action to get investment into their countries. And I'm determined that Britain doesn't miss out in this global race for the mm -hmm. jobs of the future. And that's why Keir Starmer and myself are putting forward our plans mm -hmm. to business leaders uh, at the World Economic Forum this week. OK, Rachel Reeves, we must leave it there. But that competition between the big blocks around the world, I'm sure, is something we'll return to another time. Thank you very much for coming Thank in you, this Laura. morning. It's great to have you in the studio. But as ever, we've been racing the clock and it is, believe it or not, nearly 10 o'clock. An hour ago, we started the programme by asking if after a scrappy week, Rishi Sunak is really keeping his promise of running a professional government after months of shambles. Does James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, think things would be simpler if all politicians publish their tax returns? Well, look, I, I think uh, we we keep hearing that we want uh, we want politicians to you know to uh, to be more like the rest of us and, and less uh, uh, to be a kind of a strange uh, and unique beast. Um, so I think that you know the rules that we apply to others, I think it's legitimate to also apply to politicians. Okay. Well, John Allen, the last time you were on the programme, you said as, you know, leader of a big company in the UK that you were starting to be quite impressed by what you heard from the Labour Party. But this sort of issue of going to Davos and all of that, does that, what do you think of that? I, I think it's absolutely right that they're reaching out to business wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of business people in Davos. So I'd say full marks for doing that while continuing to spend a lot of time talking to business in the UK. I wish the government would do the same because I think we need, we have big opportunities mm -hmm. long term. I'm an optimist mm -hmm. about the future of this country. Mm -hmm. I think there are all sorts of things we could and should be doing. Um, full marks to Labour for starting to set those out. I'd like the government to do the same. But are they not even under Rishi Sunak? Because the last time we talked, you know, things were yeah, difficult. Yeah. There'd been real Tory chaos. He was meant to be drawing a line. Is there, has nothing changed? I don't see the engagement with business that's needed. I think a future economic growth plan mm -hmm. needs to be bought into both by business and the government and indeed the universities. We have an amazing 
global leadership position in universities, four of the top ten. Mm -hmm. We need to engage all those people to create the future. Now, we're very short on time. Um, Ian Duncan Smith, who I have to remind people has admitted to being an old rocker. Um, do you feel worried <laughs> briefly hearing that from John Allen, from a big businessman saying that actually you guys are falling behind? Well, well I do, and I also agree because I think the big thing now we have to do is to lift our heads up and explain to people where we're going to go to get growth how we're going to reduce the burdens on industry and on individuals through tax reduction in due course, but also regulation change. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons for leaving the EU was to get our regulations relevant to the UK. That is a very big undertaking. There are some mm -hmm. potential, huge potential business markets. Medtech, centred in the UK, could be bigger than financial services. All that is why you should be uh, uh, sort of so, optimistic about it. So you'd say there's lots, of, lots, lots up for grabs. Rachel Johnson, are you optimistic? Well, I mean, just on growth, I think that one way of going against growth is just scrapping all those EU regulations just for the sake of it. I think you should be much more selective about that. Uh -huh. uh, the ones that business wants to get rid of, consider, but don't just have a bonfire of the regulations, I because I think that uh, that is not uh, the way Ten to seconds go. to have a big argument about Brexit. There's a whole other right, conversation, a whole other in. program, a whole other few years of debate. John, very, very quickly, who do you want to see playing on top of Buckingham <clears throat> Palace? Tom Jones. Tom Jones, there we go. He's Pink still Floyd, singing. Rolling Stones, Tom Jones. Tom. Amazing recommendations from all my old rockers. Rachel, not you, of course. The other two. Thank you both so much, very much, for being with us this morning. A huge thank you to my excellent trio at the table, Rachel Johnson, Ian Duncan Smith, and the Tesco chair, John Allen. We're closing out one tricky week for Rishi Sunak's government, but another one beckons. One cabinet minister has told me privately they believe that Nadine Zahawi may soon be on his way out because of everything that has happened with his tax affairs. But the foreign secretary this morning defended his colleague. But will that hold? Will they have to answer some of those outstanding questions? You can join the conversation right now on the BBC Live page. I'll be scribbling there in a while. And as ever, you can catch up with any of our programmes on the iPlayer. And I hope very much to see you, same time, same place, next week. Goodbye till then.